Part of that was I needed a new engine. This would be the fourth engine this car would have had. Prior to COVID, um, I commuted into Boston every day for work. And during that, I took public transportation. I took the bus every single day to work. And as a car guy, that's both a blessing and a curse. So taking public transportation is awful, but allows you to have a car that you really don't have to worry about commuting in. So my daily driver at the time was a 2015 GT3, which was a great car and a great daily driver that you don't have to drive to work. But once COVID hit, my wife and I decided to move away from the city and out to the suburbs. And I wasn't gonna be going into the office every day, but she still felt that I should have maybe a, a little lower key, a little bit more reliable car to drive around the suburbs in. So I reluctantly decided that, you know, I'll buy another car that I can drive around. Looked around a little bit, everything I thought was kind of boring, but then I finally decided on what my reliable low key car would be. It would be a yellow Range Rover. And as you know, Range Rovers are very reliable and very low key. So I started looking around. I wanted specifically a 1997 P38 Range Rover Vitesse. They only made 250 of them. Half of them were red, Monza red, and the other half were AA yellow. And the Vitesse was the top of the line Range Rover. They only made it for one year in 1997. And people consider that maybe the, the best version of the P38 with the yellow interior and the yellow piping inside the car. So I knew it was gonna be hard to find, so I went out looking for it and I found one for sale in Clearfield, Pennsylvania, right outside of uh, Pittsburgh. It was for sale for months. I kept looking at it, looking at it, hoping that maybe it would disappear and I wouldn't end up buying it, but it never did. So I decided I'd make the trek out there and at least look at it and see if it was in good condition. It was the only one for sale I could find in the entire country the whole of the time I was looking. So I drove out there, met the owner of the dealership uh, who had been using it as kind of a daily car it looked like. It was a little rough shape, but took a look around it. There's no check engine lights, but there was a lot of Steeler stuff in the car. There was Steeler stuff all in the back seat, underneath the seats, there was a Steeler sticker on the back. So I kind of asked him like, you know, you, you a huge Steelers fan, what's up with this? And he said, no, no. He's like, this car was owned by the Rooney family who owned the Steelers. They had it before me. This was their car. They used it for tailgating. This is all their stuff. And I was like, wow, I'm like, that's a cool story. I'm not gonna pay extra for that, but at least decent, know that it was a car that had been in the area. And so he's like, oh, come with me. I'm gonna show you the stack of receipts I have from the Rooney family. They took very good care of this car. So he brings out a binder full of receipts that are maybe like three inches thick. And I start flipping through it. And I noticed a lot of receipts from the uh, Land Rover dealer there and the Land Rover dealer down in Florida. And a lot of them on the bottom, they just said, put it on the black card. And that was just written on the bottom of all the receipts. Because P38s are not necessarily known for their reliability, having this stack of receipts was, I thought, pretty good. Especially some of the big ticket items were replacing the engine not once, but twice in their ownership of it. So I thought, at least it's got a new engine, there's no check engine lights, fine. The love of Range Rovers is a difficult thing to explain. I'm not exactly sure what it is. I do love them. My wife has a newer one, which has been slightly more reliable than mine, but there's just something about them. It's the ability to drive them anywhere and get there comfortably. And like Jeep, the ads are, you can go anywhere. But for like Range Rovers, it's not just going anywhere, it's getting there comfortably. There has to be something special because so many people just empty their pocketbooks to keep these things on the road for, for no other reasonable or rational explanation for that. So he decided I'm going to start negotiating with the guy at this dealership. He wanted a lot of money for it because it was, to him, a museum piece, I think, of, you know, Steelers history. The Rooney's owned it. And to him, that was worth a lot of money. To me, that was worth no money. And we finally agreed on a, I think, much lower than he wanted amount after I convinced him that I was probably the only person coming through the door looking for a 20 year old yellow Range Rover. We agreed on the deal and he said, well, well you have to take all the Steeler stuff with it and you have to leave all the Steeler stickers on the car. It's part of the car. And I'm like, no, I won't, I won't be doing that. If I try to drive this car around Boston with Steeler stickers on it, it's going to be destroyed. Much to his chagrin, he finally agreed that I could take the car and as soon as I get home, all the Steeler stuff came off. And it was great. I enjoyed driving the car around. It was very reliable at first, a very comfortable car. And I was used to having older cars. I had a BMW E30s before, I had some older Jeeps. So I was like, I'm used, I'm ready for 
classic Range Rover ownership. I thought I knew everything there was to know, and I was ready for any particular issues that could pop up. I was not quite ready for what was about to happen. Almost immediately, I started to get a lot of uh, oil leaks from the front of the car. Some of the suspension started making some weird noises. The air suspension would only go up on one side, or not at all, and it would ride around on its bump stops, which was not great. So I made an appointment at a local Land Rover independent mechanic to take a look. I was then greeted with a bill for about five digits worth of repairs that it needed, which was more than I paid for the car when I bought it a couple, about a month ago. And then they had the car for three months to perform all the repairs. So in that my first six months of ownership, I only physically had possession of the car for about three months. I only fixed about half of the things that they say were actually wrong with the car, and I decided I could probably fix the rest of them myself. Part of that was I needed a new engine. This would be the fourth engine this car would have had, and thankfully our friend and his dad run TWS Motors in Rainham, and they are known for their Rover motors. So I asked them to build me an upgraded 5 liter for it, which is still in the process of being built to install in the car. I've also completely refabbed the air suspension. I wanted to keep it on air suspension for as much as humanly possible. I know a lot of people rip that out because that is far and away the cheaper, more practical thing to do, but it's part of the Range Rover's DNA to have an air suspension, so I wanted to keep it. And at great time and aggravation, I think I've worked out all the kinks to the air suspension. The next thing was the BECM, which is the controller for all the body equipment in the Range Rover, started to freak out and fail. The P38 was one of the first cars that had a central computer that controlled everything in the car, and it consisted of this box that was mounted underneath of the passenger seat that has about 15 to 20 plugs plugged into it. Everything in the car runs through this box underneath the passenger seat, which is not waterproof and is underneath the cup holder. For the car. So I uh, took out the seat, took this out, and it had just coffee just spilled all over it. Trying to find someone in the US to fix this was non existent, and Range Rover will not help you at all. So I had to send the computer to Wales for them to fix it. Someone that's independent over there, they sent it back to me and it completely changed the car. It's much more reliable now, except for the slight issue of the car only came with one key and it has an immobilizer that allows the BCM to talk to the engine's computer. And if you don't have the key coded by Land Rover, the engine will not turn on. So if you ever lose that one key, the car will be bricked and it will never run ever again. And you cannot buy a spare key from Land Rover. They don't make them anymore, they won't sell you one. They'll sell you like a regular key without the immobilizer in it. I've had this car now, I'm walking on eggshells with my one and only key, hopefully I never lose it. And it's getting more reliable every day. As I've put more money into it, I've now spent about triple what the original purchase price of the car was on maintenance, and that's after the Roonies spent probably double to triple what their purchase price of the brand new car was back in 97 maintaining it. So this car has cost probably four or five times in its original purchase price in maintenance over the course of its life. But it's still going strong, and it'll be better than ever when I finish it. Adding up the receipts that I have for the car, plus what I've put into it, and assuming that there are other receipts I probably don't have, I estimate that it's probably cost, over the last 25 years, $1,000 a month to keep this car on the road. And that's on top of over $100,000 of depreciation from the new purchase price of the car. I am away collecting my next bad automotive decision, but in my absence, I told the team from Glossit that we needed to bring back the free gloss. That was your favorite promotion a couple of years ago, and so the next 500 of you can get a free bottle of their amazing award-winning detail spray. All you have to do is pay the shipping and handling. So check it out now at the link in the description below. I love it. I love their DIY ceramic coating, but I use the detail sprays all the time. You'll love it. So check out the link now, get you some gloss at goodness, and thank them for their support of VinWiki.